Laura Advance One here. We're going to try to move a little fast here, and uh, I'll be talking back and forth to Laura because I'm having trouble launching from my end. I'm up in the state of Ohio, basically on the uh, Michigan uh, Ohio border, and maybe things aren't working too well here. But let me tell you what I'm up to here. Uh, I have a, a very fundamental research uh, focus that is going to benefit, I think, our industry and, and, and uh, also uh, geophysical insights and the, uh, expanding the market to whom they can uh, offer their uh, uh, unsupervised machine learning uh, software. And that purpose is to get our industry to raise uh, shear wave reflection seismology up to the same use and prominence as P wave reflection seismology is and has been now for several decades. And there's really a, a kind of a simple answer why uh, shear wave reflection seismology has not uh, been widely accepted in our industry. And it, it's a problem at the source end. And so what I have on the screen right now <clears throat> is a, a little cartoon that kind of summarizes how our industry has, has uh, practiced the acquisition of uh, uh, seismic shear waves uh, uh, in the past. And you can see that in the first uh, uh, row across that uh, PowerPoint, I have a clock time. And I'm trying to show that in order to generate shear waves, three different sources had to come to a source station at three different clock times. And the second line of the diagram shows you the displacement vector that each of those sources applied uh, to the earth at that source station, a vertical one, Z, then a radial horizontal one X and a transverse horizontal displacement Y. And the bottom line then shows the uh, uh, various wave modes that were captured by each of those uh, source inputs. And so to get real uh, complete shear wave data, you had to function this way. And right there lies the problem. That's very expensive to use three sources rather than one source as P wave data are acquired. And uh, the only effective horizontal displacement sources are vibrators. That's why I, I drew a, a truck there, because that's that's really about the only effective horizontal displacement source our industry's come up with. And you cannot uh, pick up the telephone right now and and find a horizontal vibrator to use. And even if you could, then there are many areas across the Earth's surface where you cannot use it. Swamps, marshes, dense timber, uh, very rough mountainous terrains and so forth. But in all of those surface environments, we can use some kind of a P-wave source, either a vertical vibrator or buried explosives. And so <clears throat> what uh, uh, a small group of us researchers have uh, established right now is that, advance the slide right now if you would, uh, Laura, please. that what we, we show here is a, <clears throat> a simple uh, vertical vibrator, and, and that one vibrator makes only one visit at clock time T1, and there is a way to get, uh, get a direct downgoing shear uh, wave from that vibrator and also from a buried explosive source just uh, that works just as well for uh, uh, imaging deep geology as does the... Uh, direct P wave generated by these sources. So uh, Laura, advance uh, one more time. Therefore, why are we talking about uh, VSP data? Well, probably the biggest technical problem that uh, I am encountering on trying to get uh, our industry to understand that you can use P waves for S wave illumination is that there's been a, a study done way back in the 1950s that calculated the P wave and shear wave um, <coughs> illumination patterns that are generated by a vertical vibrator. And that study showed that, uh, <coughs> yes, there was a lot of shear wave energy produced by a, like a vertical vibrator. In fact, more shear wave energy than P energy, but none of that uh, shear wave energy traveled away, let's say from the base plate of a, of a 
vertical vibrator in a vertical or near vertical direction. In fact, it would be a cone like plus minus third degrees away from vertical that there simply was no uh, sheer illumination. And if that isn't true, then yes, you cannot use uh, a vertical vibrator for a shear wave reflection seismology. Uh, your your downgoing illuminating wave field has to leave the source station uh, in a vertical direction and have a rich amount of energy in, in small uh, takeoff angles from true vertical. Therefore, uh, we look now, or I, I look now at, at uh, VSP data, because if you want to see what goes down from a source, then VSP data define that in a very rigorous way. And if you want to know if the energy is traveling vertically, then look at a zero offset VSP. And so that's what I have uh, drawn here is a zero uh, offset VSP. The uh, receiver stations, the black dots are going up close to the uh, Earth's surface. And BP, that's the uh, uh, the base plates, they have a, a vertical vibrator, and I'm showing a, an area around each of those um, uh, base plates that have their physical size of that gray shaded area <clears throat> depends on whether the uh, velocity in, in the layers uh, at and near the surface have a slow velocity or fast velocity because that shaded area is what we call the near field zone. And that is uh, that zone around an, uh, an illuminating energy source that extends out for a distance of, of uh, one uh, wavelength away from the, the point of energy generation. And the first wavelength of the uh, uh, propagating wave field is created in that near field zone. And therefore, it is very difficult to look inside that near field zone, because how do you look at seismic wave field when not even one full wavelength of the data are generated? And that is the, uh, the technical problem that makes some zero offset VSPs difficult to, uh, for, uh, for you to backtrack a downgoing P wave, S wave back up to the surface and prove with great confidence that yes, it was generated directly at the surface where the base plate is. So I've looked at a lot of VSPs in uh, slow velocity media where it's very easy to show that. The problem is when you get into a fast velocity medium and those shallow geophones are inside that near field zone, then there's really some serious problems that pop up. And that's what I'm going to show you here and then e expand that uh, uh, investigation to show you how unsupervised machine learning is just revealing things in VSP data that uh, I have never uh, been able to see before. And probably some of you know that I wrote the first book in the English language on VSP back in 1982. So I've been in this VSP game a long time. And for me to say that, hey, I'm finally finding a way to investigate those data that's telling me things I have never seen or realized before, I think uh, it's, it's worth listening to me. And that thing that I'm referring to that's doing that is unsupervised machine learning, which is a capability that's offered by the Paradise software provided by Geophysical Insight. So Laura advanced me one more time here, and I'm going to move a little bit quicker than I did yesterday to try to get to, through all this material. So there's a definition of the near field zone. You know, it just says in words what I, I have uh, spoken uh, verbally here. And uh, advance again, Laura, if you would. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, this diagram here shows you the actual VS, uh, zero offset VSP that we'll be looking at. The rocks in the near surface are fast velocity. I have them labeled there in the lower right. If you can see that, VP is up to 10,000 feet per second in the surface layer. So the wavelengths are long, and the actual depths of the uh, geophones are shown on the left uh, by the numbered circles, one, two, three, four. For, it's 50 feet between uh, uh, adjacent uh, VSP receivers. And certainly the first two and maybe the first three of those <clears throat> receivers are inside that near field zone. So keep that in mind. This may be the first time you you looked at VSP data that is in trying to look inside what we call the near field zone. Uh, advance me again, Laura. Okay, and we're going to look at a lot, uh, or I looked at a lot of, of, of instantaneous attributes, and, and I'm going to go through these 
kind of kind of fast because um, there, there gets to be a little bit of redundancy. I realize now that I've made this presentation once, and the, but the two uh, uh, instantaneous attributes that were really uh, helpful in looking inside the near field zone are those two on the in the rightmost column there that have the double asterisk. Uh, that being the instantaneous phase and the relative acoustic impedance, and you'll see evidence of that in what I'll be showing you pretty soon. So it, advance again, Laura. Okay, these are the actual data, and it's divided into the panels like we typically do with VSP data. Vertical geophone responses on the left, radial horizontal geophone responses in the center, transverse horizontal geophone responses on the far right. And the uh, first thing I probably need to point out is that uh, if you look up here in the extreme upper left corner, you can see that uh, here on the vertical geophones, I'm, I'm pointing at that. I don't know if you can see my partner moving on your screen or not. I hope so. But that shows that these uh, ref, uh, there's, a, there's a wave that's going all the way up to the shallowest uh, geophone which would be inside the near field zone. So you might ask the question, hey, wh what, what's all this nonsense about uh, not being able to look inside that near that uh, near field zone? Well, the uh, new gain that's been applied to those data is, is just uh, tremendously large. And what you will see is that when you try to calculate instantaneous attributes, you cannot get any instantaneous attribute to go inside that near field zone. It's just like the, it's a it's a haunted house here at Halloween time that I'm not going to go in there, boss, you know. And and so that's telling you that there's things going on with the data inside that near field zone that uh, <clears throat> are different than the data are outside of that zone. Uh, and uh, I'll very quickly get to some uh, instantaneous uh, uh, attribute displays that will uh, convince you what, what I'm saying here. But we're going to look at at, uh, at these data now a little bit more closely and, and, and uh, specifically we're going to expand the uh, the data up in that upper left corner and concentrate just on these upgoing events that uh, are originating somewhere at the at the base plate. So Laura advance again please. So here is a zoom view of the just the vertical geophone data. And now for the first time, look at the responses. Uh, you know, that, that's the geophone receiver stations going from left to right horizontally there. And uh, uh, look at where uh, re, uh, receiver stations one and two are. And where's the data? You know, there's something making some colors in there, but basically, that's telling you there's no data in, in there or there's a tr the data are tremendously changed for whatever reason and even uh, from about the receiver station two on down to receiver station six the data are are faded but it's still you know uh, very uh, believable data in the, in that zone uh, so laura advance again and now then we're going to be looking at uh, some of the uh, uh, attributes I said that instantaneous phase was very helpful on backtracking things into the near field zone. And here you can see these phase lines, those yellow lines, that uh, you can follow a deep yellow line all the way up to receiver station one, which is definitely inside the, the near field zone. And the uh, phase lines do, do not seem to have uh, obvious breaks as they transition from near field zone to far field zone. So that's encouraging that, you know, maybe maybe some attributes can kind of probe uh, in, into that near field zone in some way. Uh, Laura uh, advanced me again, and we may uh, move pretty quickly here if I know where I am. All right, now then, we're simply going to now, I want to flash this back again so you can kind of see what data I'm looking at. We're going to now look at these uh, radial uh, horizontal geophone data in the center panel. And uh, now then you can see a down going P uh, uh, sloping uh, uh, down to the right. But there then are these events here <clears throat> that are also sloping down to the right at later times that are traveling with slower velocities. And those are shear waves. Now, if you go to the first one of those, and it's labeled converted S uh, in, in the white uh, uh, oval circle, you can follow that back 
upward to shallower uh, receiver stations and see where it intersects the P wave, you know, uh, at, a, at a depth of, uh, of uh, about, you know, receiver station, I've got 12 or so. And so that's a converted uh, shear wave where the downgoing P at a uh, uh, rather uh, sizable reflection uh, contrast, uh, impedance contrast, uh, converted some of its downgoing energy into uh, downgoing shear and created that shear wave. But then there are other shear waves at later time, and so there's a white oval on the extreme right of that uh, radial geophone pattern that's labeled direct S, and if you try to track it back up, you can kind of see that its slope is going to take you almost directly up to the surface, but you cannot, with great, great confidence, track that event uh, through the uh, shallowest part of these data. It's just too jumbled and complicated there. So, it, Laura, advance again. And here is a zoom view of the radial horizontal geophone data, and we get the same effect we did with VSP data. If you look at the response of uh, certainly G2, it's just saying, boy, you know, I, I'm, I'm losing uh, all almost all my data character and these geophones. And that's where certainly the, the near field zone is. Uh, and then about receiver station three, well, you kind of see that the data begin to convert into the uh, black red peaks troughs that we are used to seeing in our data and you get a little bit more comfortable that hey I look like kind of ordinary data that we're used to working with uh, begins to uh, appear and become usable about receiver station three uh, which as my i drew the diagram uh, some uh, slides back you know was where i thought the uh, uh, the boundary of the near field zone probably extended to Let's see, uh, Laura. Let's 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 advance. Uh, I think we're going to advance to the two slide. Yeah, go on past that one. Oh, right there. Now here is uh, w one of the attributes that was uh, quite uh, definitive on trying to backtrack these downgoing PNS data to their points of origin. And if you can read the label up there, that that is the relative acoustic impedance uh, that you can derive. Um, uh, uh, probably from anybody's uh, instantaneous attribute package, certainly you can from the uh, paradise package that uh, Geophysical Insights has. And you can see I've, I've added some uh, black dash lines there that kind of help you visually uh, see the trend of, of energy movement that I'm trying to backtrack. So you can see where the direct P is up there. That's a fast traveling velocity. Then these uh, dash lines that have a greater slope to them, that's a slower traveling a package of energy, and that's the shear wave. And if you look at the one that's labeled direct S, <clears throat> why you will, you will see that those dash lines, you can extend them with, with great confidence up to receiver station five, and then you uh, sort of get a little jumble there, and you have to decide, do I follow the lower green or cut across a red and go to that upper green? But basically, it, it's going to terminate somewhere in the vicinity of 100 milliseconds. <clears throat> now, uh, let me uh, hasten to say that the instantaneous frequency, uh, I mean, instantaneous phase attribute, if it, it, it in, uh, arrived here at um, receiver station one at roughly 50 milliseconds, okay? And <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, VSP receiver well was 195 feet away from the source station. That was labeled on the diagram. The, probably there's just too much clutter on that diagram for you to maybe catch that detail. So the distance from the base plate to uh, the re uh, receivers one and two is in round numbers, it's 200 feet. And so if the uh, P wave velocity uh, got there uh, in uh, at 50 milliseconds, why it's kind of, and and we have pretty uh, uh, competent uh, high velocity material there in the near surface, which is obvious, I think. Then <clears throat> the uh, VPVS velocity ratio of about two would be reasonable to assume. 
And uh, so if you make that assumption, then that says shear wave arrival at that station. If, if the P wave arrival is 50 milliseconds, the shear wave arrival should be about 100 milliseconds. And you can see that's where that uh, black dash line is trying to lead you, okay? Uh, advance one more time, Laura. Okay, the, now we're going to look at the transverse horizontal geophone. I'm not going to talk too much about the uh, the wiggle trace display we have on the screen. You've seen it several times now. Uh, advance again, Laura. <clears throat> and here is the phase, same as as before. You can you can backtrack them. Uh, certainly, uh, the, the the P wave. Uh, you you can backtrack it up to the surface. And then there's slower traveling uh, uh, phase alignments that have to be shear waves. And it's a little difficult to track it through some of the uh, the mess around the receiver stations 11 to, to 15. There's just a lot of upgoing uh, P wave reflections cutting across the downgoing shears at that point. It complicates phase relationships. But you can kind of see that there is a phase line uh, that is, again, bringing you into uh, maybe just a little bit below uh, the 100 millisecond uh, timing line. Advance again, Laura, and we're going to look now at that second, that same attribute again, the uh, relative acoustic impedance, and here it is, and again, now you can see where the uh, uh, trends for the uh, direct P and for the direct S are drawn, and uh, that uh, trend for the direct S it again brings you to receiver station one at a little bit past uh, 100 milliseconds. And so again here for this most difficult uh, type of, of uh, zero offset v uh, VSP data that you can find to backtrack down coin events to their point of origin, that being can a zero offset VSP that is acquired where there are high velocity materials and layering uh, immediately at the surface. We have been successful here on showing, okay, even in that most challenging type of, of backtracking environment that you can have for zero set VSP, we can still backtrack the down going P and S to show that they were both generated at the uh, surface source station uh, simultaneously. All right. Uh, now let's advance again. Uh, Laura, and we're going to uh, transition now into some uh, machine learning uh, uh, concepts. And the first thing I want to do is, is um, uh, calculate the principal components of the P and the S data. And uh, advance, Laura, uh, while I, I continue to talk, that the principal components that uh, <clears throat> uh, advance past that again also, uh, Laura. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to look at principal components of uh, both um, uh, of all three geophones. That's the reason I flashed the, uh, the wiggle trace geophone data there again, and I asked her to, to just take off the screen. And we start, of course, with the vertical geophone data here. So the PCA, that means the principal component analysis. So what is a principal component analysis? I'll, I'll give you a very uh, quick uh, uh, version of that, uh, that... Uh, <clears throat> The uh, uh, dimension of the attribute space that we're dealing with here is relatively large. It, I showed you just very, very quickly uh, back at the start the list of, of uh, instantaneous attributes that were calculated, and there were 15 of those. And there's actually 16 because, uh, attributes because the input data from which all those 15 attributes were calculated, those input data are also an attribute, and that's 16. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, attribute space that we are dealing with is a 16-dimensional space. And what principal components try to do is two things. Number one, they say no one can really work in a high-dimensional data space. You know, you, you can't see what's going on, you know, our, our human mind can't go beyond three dimensions in, in visualizing things. So uh, how can we reduce the number of dimensions down to something that is manageable? And uh, 
the second thing you're going to, the principal components do, it allows you to actually throw some of the attributes, dismiss them as, as being of any significant value in whatever analysis you want to do. Now, let me show you uh, how those two things work here with these data. Now, we're looking at principal components that were determined for the uh, the, uh, the vertical geophone data that now you've seen uh, displayed several times, and the height of those black um, uh, spikes that you see there, those are m indications of the amount of attribute information that's embedded in this principal component. If you have a 16D uh, data uh, attribute space, then you will also have to have 16 principal components. And so the, the components are numbered down on the bottom, one, two, three, four, and principal component one, that is the first one that's created. And so when you start, it starts looking at the, uh, at the data in, in every attribute space, it's free to go across that data space in any direction it wants to go. And so it, its mathematical requirement is find the largest dimension of that data space and go that direction and do the same in, in, the, in, the, in the second attribute space, the third attribute space, and so on and so on. And so uh, principal component one gobbles up a huge amount of information. All right, now then you're going to make principal component two. And you can see on this diagram that uh, its, its amplitude is, is smaller. Uh, but the, the reason that it is smaller is that the mathematical requirement of making principal components is uh, number two uh, uh, pr uh, principal component. You also can look through all 16 dimensions of this data space and find the largest dimension in each one of those spaces that, and this is the important requirement, that it, you can only do that in a direction that is normal to the direction that any previous uh, principal component went through that data space. And so uh, principal component two, it still can look at a, a big variation in the data when its requirement is that every direction it looks has to be normal to the way that principal component one went through those data. And then you come to principal component three, and it's allowed the same freedom. You can go through every dimension uh, that is available to you as long as the direction you go is perpendicular to the direction that both principal component one and principal went through those data. And so you can see that as you go to higher dimension principal components, this mathematical uh, constraint that they have to probe the attribute space in directions that, that are perpendicular to the directions that all preceding uh, principal components went through that data space, they, they just, you know, that's why you see the amplitudes are just decrease, 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 decrease. And so what we're seeing here that those first three uh, uh, principal components here, they actually provide you 50% of the total information in the attribute space. And so you, in, in my uh, decision, that's the only three I'm going to work with. Others may say that's not enough. I want to you know, at least get 60% of the information or 70%. It's a personal decision. But uh, we're going to go forward here saying we're just going to work with those three. We're going to get 50% uh, of the total information, and that's going to be enough for us to make valuable decisions about what's the fabric of this VSP data. Now, you'll see the arrows that peel off of the top of each of those eigenvalue spikes and point over to the right to a box that lists uh, uh, specific attributes. And those are telling you what attributes contribute to the information in, in that principal component. And you can see uh, the, the labeling there is getting a little fuzzy, I can see, and it may be difficult to read. Uh, uh, the, these PowerPoints should be on the uh, Geophysical Insights uh, uh, website. You know, you can download it and look at them, you know, at your leisure. But you can see that uh, it's only taking three attributes to give like, you know, uh, 75 and 90 percent of the information that's embedded in, in each of those um, uh, eigenvalues. So now then, uh, hopefully this explanation has helped you see how principal component number one reduces the number of, princi of principal components that you need to consider in order to 
get the, the, the total information in, in a database and it allows you to, to reduce the dimensions. The dimensions are these, what's in those uh, boxes on the right side. That's, that's, the, that's the actual dimensions of the data space. So Laura, advance again. And this is the principal component uh, analysis for the radial geophone. And you'll see things are, are essentially the same. The first three eigenvalues are the big, they're the big bruisers that capture, yeah, this one didn't quite get uh, half of it, got 47% of it. And then again, it only took, in the, in the boxes on the right, it only taken three attributes to contribute almost all the information that's in those three uh, uh, principal components. And advance again, Laura. And what? Now here's the uh, principal component analysis for the transfer geophone. Same story. And in fact, if uh, if I wasn't going so fast and we could talk uh, and ponder a little bit slower, you'd see that the uh, the numbers is about percents of things, and 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 the uh, attributes that are listed in those boxes, they are just uh, uh, identical essentially for the horizontal and uh, and uh, transverse horizontal data. Uh, so uh, we're going to kind of now and then look at these uh, uh, these conclusions, I think, in some tables of my memories right. Advance again, Laura. Yes. So now then, the left column here <clears throat> is showing the three databases that we have analyzed with principal component analysis, the vertical geophone data, radial geophone data, transverse geophone data. And we're only, we said, okay, we're only going to use the first three eigenvectors. And so that's the column of information that extends to the right. And then I list uh, under each of those uh, eigenvectors, the specific attributes that contribute their information and in brackets, the per percent of the information that they do contribute. And let's look down these, uh, first of all, let's look down the uh, vertically, uh, what composes a, uh, uh, eigenvector one for each of the three geophones. And if you look eigenvector one, look vertically down that first column, all three attributes are identical. Instantaneous frequency, thin bed, acceleration of phase. And that's telling you that eigenvector one is exactly the same for vertical geophone data, radial geophone data, transverse geophone data. And people, that's what kind of set me back on my heels because I, I was thinking, hey, no way, because P waves, you know, and shear waves, they probe rocks in orthogonal directions. And this is telling me that I can, that they're probing a rock, say, vertically, and then one dip probing it horizontally, and they're getting the same attribute information, uh, irrespective of what direction that, that displacement vector for each of those wave fields is oriented. Uh, that's what this says. Uh, and but I would uh, my brain wasn't ready for that, so I, I've got to kind of re, you know reset some things in my brain. Now, if you continue over to eigenvectors two and three, you see the same thing. Uh, look at eigenvector two, that column, that first group of three at the top. All right. Now you, you go down to uh, a radial geophone. Those three there are not the same. But look look over uh, at eigenvector three on, in the second row, and there they are. And if you remember, eigenvector two and three were, had almost exactly the same amplitudes in the PC uh, analysis graphs that we just passed through. And and so if you have time to look at this later, this, why it'll show you that the the uh, <clears throat> attributes in eigenvectors two and three they are exactly the same too. Uh, there's going to be two of them that switch it, uh, which eigenvector they want to belong to. But both eigenvectors having essentially the same amplitude, it doesn't matter uh, which of the two, you know, a group of these uh, attributes decide to be in. And so the bottom line here is that uh, the PCA analysis is saying, uh, hey, uh, Bob, uh, your uh, these particular uh, zero offset VSP data, they've got the same uh, attribute fabric in the uh, vertical geophone response as they have in uh, both radial and transverse horizontal geophone responses. That, that's that's news to me. All right, advance again, Laura. 
Okay, now we're going to uh, go kind of quickly through this concept of self-organized maps. And this is where you really see the power of unsupervised machine learning. And so uh, what the uh, concept of, uh, of self-organizing maps are, I'll give you my uh, kind of a layman's description of this, which is not going to be maybe as rigorous a theory as, uh, as, as it should be. But nonetheless, what uh, self-organizing maps does is that it, it creates some entities that we refer to as neurons, and it lets those neurons probe through all of the database that you're wanting to examine. And those neurons search for where there are certain combinations of attributes that have certain percentage contributions to themselves. And that a neuron likes to build a cluster of image points where he, they, he or she, whatever you would call this uh, neuron, where he finds this condition of here's the uh, attribute combination I'm searching for, and these attributes are ranked in uh, the percentage of importance that I want them to be. Those are my people. I hope that made a little sense. Uh, it's The graphics I think are going to be coming up now will maybe help you a bit on seeing what I'm trying to explain. Uh, Laura, advance again. All right. <clears throat> when you use these uh, neurons, you have to create a, you know, a neuron family. And and uh, the family that I created are the 25 objects shown in the uh, red grid on, on the left there. Each one of those grid cells is a neuron. And uh, they are six-sided uh, cells. And that means that information can, say from neuron 13 right there in the middle, information can flow across the boundary of neuron 13 to, to each of the six neurons that surround it. And so if neuron 13 wants to move a distance uh, in a certain direction to go toward where uh, he thinks there is the combination of attributes that are needed, he needs to find, then... Um, uh, those comp six companions also move in that direction, but at a, a smaller distance. I think, I may be wrong, so don't hold me to this, I think uh, Paradise Software lets them move like one-third of the distance that 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 thirteen number 13 moves. And then, of course, if 19 wants to go a different direction on the, on the next what we call epoch of training, why, it wants to drag 13 with it in that direction and so forth. So these guys are really pushing and shoving and trying to fight their way through data space to find the uh, attribute conditions that they want to belong to. Now then, look on the right, and at the top you'll see, I have a comment there, that neurons number 1, 11, and 21, they define the downgoing uh, direct P. And uh, all three of those neurons are in the leftmost vertical column of this uh, uh, neuron map. So advance again, uh, uh, Laura. All right, <clears throat> on the uh, black screen at the bottom, on the far left, that's uh, where neuron one found its, um, its family. And uh, I believe there were like 174 data points along that, that white trend there. So what we're looking at here are the VSP data. The horizontal axis what will again be depth increasing this, the Earth's surface as the far left of the horizontal uh, uh, <clears throat> axis and uh, the deepest receivers at the far right. And then uh, uh, travel time for the VSP data, uh, that's the vertical axis, all right? So you're looking at that down uh, sloping white line. That's a part of the downgoing uh, P first arrival which is an event I already uh, referred to as the direct P. All right, now that we go to the center panel <clears throat> and we add neuron 11 to neuron one, and you can see that that white line has increased in thickness. And now then go to the rightmost panel and we've added neuron 21, and it has uh, thickened and widened the line e even more. And so in combination, those three neurons do only one thing, and they build the downgoing direct P first arrival. Advance again, Laura. And what we will see when the next screen comes up, the uh, neuron family that we uh, started with, but now then look at what uh, is, is written in the, in the black font in the lower right, saying neurons 3, 12, and 23, 
they define p reflections and uh, and also mul p multiples. Okay. So uh, advance and let's see how that works out, Laura. Okay, far left, that's what neuron three finds. And now then, <clears throat> the uh, uh, the first downgoing event sloping down to the right, that is later in time than the downgoing uh, P arrival. I need to uh, make a better quality display of these. It's probably in color and had some numbers on the, uh, on the axes that help people see some uh, uh, the evidence of what I'm now saying in words. But you're beginning to see evidence of uh, very weak evidence of uh, some upgoing P reflections. And let me make a comment here. You know where the near field zone would be? That would be in the extreme upper left corner of each of these three uh, black screens. And notice how black that is. These neurons said, hey, boss, I'm not going in that spot. I can't. I cannot get in there. And that's the near field zone. Now then, as you add neuron 12 uh, in the center uh, display, uh, you can see that you uh, add more evidence of downgoing uh, multiples in particular. And then you add neuron 23, and it, uh, it continues to build the downgoing multiples. And, and if you look real closely and spend some time, you can see that upgoing P reflections are also getting built pretty boldly. Uh, Time when 23 adds its its contributions. So Laura, advance one more time, <clears throat> and uh, we're going to now look at these tables again. And so uh, let's go to the top about the uh, downgoing P first arrival. And there are those three neurons that we use to uh, show uh, what the what the those uh, three neurons are defining: one, eleven, and twenty-one. And now then, if you look across uh, each, each uh, row, you will see the attributes that belong to those neurons. You know, I, all I've been saying up this point is they wanted to find certain neurons that had certain amounts of that neuron energy involved, but I didn't, it, I didn't tell you what neuron it was, nor how, how, how much of a contribution that neuron made to influence that, uh, I mean, that attribute made to uh, influence that neuron. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Paradise Software, see that, uh, that detailed information. So now it's where you're really looking at the fabric of the downgoing P illuminating uh, wavelet uh, at the top, and down at the bottom, you're looking at the internal fabric of the P reflections, and you, you see what neurons are, uh, I'm, not, I, I'm getting neuron and attributes uh, entangled in what I'm trying to say. You see what attributes are involved in each of those neurons and how much of each attribute it is involved in defining that neuron. And on the right, you can see how many uh, uh, data points uh, each neuron found where it thought it had a home. It may be helpful to kind of look at those, those rows of uh, of attributes and, and their percentages is sort of being like the DNA of, of, of that neuron, you know, hey, this is me. And so I found a, you know, neuron one up there at the top it says, uh, when all my family got together, we all had the same DNA. There's a, what was it, 174 of us, you know. Okay, Laura, advance again. We're getting really close to having to shut this down. <clears throat> and, um, uh, this goes a little bit farther into detail here, that it's looking at the illuminating P at the, at the neuron structure and, and the reflected P in the multiples. And, and the tables that we have looked at up this point, I only had uh, <clears throat> three uh, attributes listed because the table got too uh, complicated if you went farther than that. But, but there actually were four neurons that, that contribute to the illuminating P, five that con contribute to reflected P, and six that contributed to multiples. And so then uh, I look at those from, rank them from, from uh, in, in the columns, uh, rank them from most uh, uh, important to least important. And when the number in parentheses, which is giving you a percentage number as to how much they're contributing, uh, <clears throat> that, that attribute is to all four of those neurons. So uh, you, you see, 
what what attributes are important and how big their contributions are to these neurons that are building the downgoing illuminating P. Where I have the uh, X's drawn across, that is a place where, if you read down at the bottom, the contributions above and below uh, that uh, X line diminish by at least uh, what, uh, 40 percent and more. And uh, so what you see now, though, is that uh, notice the equivalence here still, if you go across, sweetness, sweetness, Hilbert, Hilbert, there's still a lot of equivalence in the attributes of illuminating P, reflected P, but there are different percentages of them and different orders of their importance. Advance again, Laura, got one or two more slides. Okay, here's your conclusions. Number one, the instantaneous attributes allow you to backtrack uh, direct S to its point of origin at the base plate, even if those shallow geophones are inside the near field zone. And uh, uh, direct P and direct S wave fields, they, ha they have the same major principal components. That's a little bit of a, of a, a surprise. And then uh, the last is that specific neurons build only the downgoing direct P. Other specific neurons build only the P reflections. So this is, is what you start gaining from unsupervised machine learning. And all of it in combination is showing you the fabric of the data. And all of this SOM analysis, we've only looked at vertical geophone data. Hadn't had time, you know, to look at horizontal geophone data. But I'm eager to get with that and I'll share what I find with people. I think, Laura, there may be one more uh, slide I'll just make. And so if you're interested in, in, in uh, what's going on, <clears throat> certainly stay in touch. Uh, you can even find my email address either uh, probably on the web or you can uh, find it through Geophysical Insights because what I'm sh listed here is where I'm going to be going with this. Got to do the same uh, very detailed analysis with horizontal geophone data. Got to go from zero offset VSP to far offset VSP. I've got to look at uh, shear waves generated by horizontal vibrators and compare them to shear waves generated by vertical vi uh, vibrators and by impact sources and buried explosives, and then go to different propagation media. So with that, I'm going to uh, uh, step back, Laura, and, and call this uh, done.